Recently I was in Ontario and I got to visit with a couple of good friends of mine, Chris Magwood and his partner Jen. And they've been running the Endeavor Center for, gosh, I don't know how many years now, a long time. I, I think it's close to 20 years, but uh, I could be wrong on that number. A long time nevertheless. And in the period of time that they've been running this center, they've been demonstrating sustainable building practices. And I would argue it's beyond sustainable building practices because they don't just talk about energy, they talk about all the other components that a lot of other sustainable buildings are quite frankly scared to address. So redless chemicals, which are basically known carcinogens, they, they work very hard to keep those out of the building. They look at the embodied carbon of buildings, so how much carbon is used to actually build a building product. They look for all sorts of unique and novel ways to integrate natural building products like straw and hemp and wood fiber. And really, I would say that the Endeavor Center and specifically Chris Magwood and Jen are leading North America and maybe even in certain domains, the world, in this type of building practice. So in this video, we're gonna go through Chris, Chris and Jen's house that they have in Peterborough, Ontario, and he'll talk about some of the highlights. It's only a 10 minute interview, so we really couldn't get to every little detail that, uh, that they thought about in this building, but we're gonna to get to the highlights of what makes it a beyond sustainable home. And if you're interested in this, I actually interviewed Chris Magwood uh, on his book, Sustainable Home Design, and you can find it in the card right here. And you can watch that. It's absolutely packed with information. And if you find that interview interesting, you're going to want to get his book. And I'll make sure that we leave a link to his sustainable home design in the show notes below. I also really recommend his book, Making Better Buildings, which will be in the show notes below as well. And that book is just absolutely packed with information. I've also done a video on Making Better Buildings, which I'll put in a card right here as well. So take a look at the interview and uh, we'll finish off with some of my thoughts on his home as a result of me touring it and getting to spend some time with Chris and go through all the different details there. Well, why don't we go for a tour of the house and we'll look at some of these components. And I think maybe one thing that you'll notice that a lot of people notice is the house kind of, we hype it as this really special building, which it is, but it doesn't necessarily appear that way because a lot of the things we've we've put into the house are just the best versions of things that people already put into houses and so you know the uh, the overall appearance isn't that different than a than a conventional build okay let's go for a tour all right so where are we going now well, we'll start in the uh, in the basement and kind of work from the from the ground up and see how it was built. Well, we don't typically do a lot of basement foundations, but uh, given that we were trying to make the house uh, sort of meet uh, a more conventional um, expectation of what a house is like, uh, we did do a basement, and so we used. Durasol um, insulated concrete forms as the foundation. So they're made from waste wood chips. So those are the little chunks you see um, bound together with cement. Uh, they're made in this bioregion. They're made just near Hamilton, Ontario. And essentially, they're kind of like a big hollow Lego block. So we literally dry stack um, all of these blocks together. There's a, an insulation insert um, in the core that's made out of uh, mineral fiber insulation. And then there's about a five inch slot where the, the concrete gets poured in. So they all get locked together with a, a matrix of concrete that's going both um, vertically in the cores and horizontally between the blocks. So this is the guts of the electrical system for the building. So we have five kilowatts of PV panels up on the south roof. And this box here is the inverter. So that's what's taking the, the DC power from those panels and changing it to AC power. And we're on a grid tied system here, so what this is doing is it's it's sending the power out through a meter on the side of the house where we get credited from the utility company as a generating station. And so 
we sort of have one account with them where we're supplying power to the grid and then on our sort of normal panel box here that's the side where we're paying for power that's incoming and so essentially we uh, get a check from the utility for what we produced and we send them uh, a payment for what we've used and the way it's worked out for us um, in the years that we've been in this house is the solar income is actually covering all our utility costs and depending on the year we sort of end up with between sort of fifteen hundred and twenty five hundred dollars in income above that so essentially you know that system is covering all of our utility costs and bringing in a, and a small amount of income every year when we were first building the house we were going to uh, try to meet the living building challenge notion of supplying a hundred percent of our water from rainwater collected on site so we brought these tanks into the building uh, to be inside the house but right now they're sort of a future project when we were working with the city on this house the sort of water collection and water treatment side uh, was one of sort of the, the bureaucratic hurdles that we dealt with and so we just decided to not uh, hook this system up right away so it's sort of a, a future plan to uh, supply as much of the building with rainwater as we can. So on the domestic hot water side of things um, we have two solar thermal collectors out on the south roof and so the heat from those is uh, coming in via this pump and that solar hot water is being stored in this tank so it's just a typical electric hot water tank but it's not plugged in so it's just a, an insulated storage medium and then what we do is we run that water from this tank through this little electric on-demand heater which is designed to read the incoming temperature and only add the amount of heat that the water needs to reach the set uh, temperature so on a good sunny day the water is just passing right through that that water heater um, but when we haven't seen the sun for a while, it's, it's using electricity to raise the, uh, the temperature to the set point. Another part of the domestic hot water system is this uh, drain heat recovery system. So uh, mostly when, when we're showering here, what happens is all the heat from the water leaving the shower is essentially leaving the building. And so what this unit does is um, the incoming cold water that's going to replace the, uh, the hot water leaving the tank comes in down at the bottom here and as it swirls through here it's picking up the heat that's leaving uh, through the drain and bringing that pre-warmed water into the solar hot water tank so that the, the incoming temperature is higher than it would have been if it was just coming from the city. For the, um, the floor framing system for this house we use these uh, wood open web joists that we got from Triforce couple really great things about them. One is they uh, they will make them with FSC certified lumber which was really important to us so we know we're getting sustainably harvested wood. But the other thing that's great is they're so lightweight that um, one person can install you know a, a, an 18-20 foot joist by themselves and they're really strong and then the, the open webbing makes it super easy to be able to run uh, ductwork, plumbing and uh, electrical through all of this. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a really great system with no metal fasteners, no um, large volume of wood. The, and the, they're so cheap because, um, or they're really affordable, I wouldn't say so cheap, but they're really affordable because rather than making uh, custom wood uh, joists, which is something that the truss manufacturers make, what these guys do is there's about a, a two foot end made out of um, OSB board and you can cut your custom length anywhere in that two feet. So rather than having to make a custom joist for every building, you just buy these to the closest two foot increment. You make your own cut and, uh, and that way there doesn't need to be the sort of the extra cost of, of making a custom floor joist for every occasion. Up here, they, they attach these by figure jointing so that everything sort of like slots together and then they're glued within the within the finger joints and that's what makes the the connection between the cords one of the main focuses that we had in this place was making sure that we were using really high quality finishes but finishes that had no chemical content so um, trying to get away from the typical sort of acrylic paints and the and the normal finishes that go on things So we use a real mix of different things here. So over on that wall there the red 
is a clay plaster. So it's a, a thin um, skim coat of plaster over drywall, literally made from, from local clay and a natural pigment and, uh, and applied to the drywall. Um, the white in this room is a lime paint. So it's a, a pre-manufactured lime paint. So you kind of get this powder that you add water to and uh, you can either roll apply it or brush apply it. And then in different parts of the house, we have some clay paints. And then in the kitchen and the main part of the house where we wanted the paints to be washable, these are um, natural oil paints. So they're from AFM Safe Coat. And so it's a, a linseed oil based paint. That's just a really great product. It's a paint that every painter would recognize. It comes in a can, it goes on a roller or a brush and uh, is you know completely washable, dries in a really reasonable time, has water cleanup. So um, we use that fairly extensively through the house too. One of the things that people who don't necessarily even know much about the house uh, really comment on and really enjoy is just the, the depth of the window sills that we end up with. So the prefab straw bale walls are 16 inches wide, so a little bit wider than a normal wall assembly. And what that does is sort of give this opportunity for a really nice deep sill, you know, great for plants, great for uh, cats, love hanging out on them. And then, yeah, th those are the, uh, the triple pane uh, inline fiberglass windows, which are sort of at the, the top end of high quality windows that are made in Canada, not as high performance as some of the European passive house windows, but also, you know, very reasonable in price. So again, this was part of balancing the house between like excellent energy performance, but not at great expense. So we found that, uh, that the, between the cost and the performance of these windows, that it was sort of the ideal compromise. One of the things that you don't necessarily see in this house, uh, but that was really important to us is that um, accessibility was built in right from the get go. So uh, the entry doors are wide enough for a wheelchair to come through uh, all of the interior doors and hallways. And here on the main floor, we built a, um, an accessible bathroom and shower. And we also put a room on the main floor that currently we use as an office, but uh, the idea being that it could also be a bedroom so that, you know, somebody with accessibility issues could function on the, on the main floor of the house entirely. Some of the big insights from building this house were A, that you don't have to spend an outrageous amount of money to get a really good green house. Um, you know, we were able to do this on a pretty conventional uh, sized budget and using materials that weren't super specialty. They were all things that we could access uh, locally. And the other is that finding that balance between energy efficiency and cost is something that's worth exploring. You know, we were able to uh, set ourselves up here so that we're not paying any utility bills, that our solar is enough to cover the costs, and yet we're not quite net zero energy. And again, getting to net zero would have pushed the costs without really bringing the benefits back to us as the owners. Um, but we sort of found a place where you know the amount of solar we had was affordable you know compared to the benefits that it's bringing in in terms of income if you are interested in uh, designing or building a house like this um, there's a lot of information in the essential sustainable home design book uh, about how to set these kinds of goals and then follow through with the uh, with the materials and systems choices and we also have a lot of workshops and um, different courses and online material at EndeavorCenter.org. If you are interested in any of the courses we have at the Endeavor Center, you can find the link in the show notes below. What did you find particularly interesting about this interview and about Chris Magwood's house? Leave those in the comments section below. For me, what I found really interesting was that you could have a house that looked almost conventional. Like, it was really difficult to tell that it was made out of straw bales. All of those walls were straw bale sips, yet the house looked like any other house in North America with maybe some slightly thicker eaves. Um, number two, the whole house was heated with a really small air-to-source heat pump, which is just unbelievable. The technology in that kind of domain is just growing by leaps and bounds, and I find that very fascinating. It means that we can live in very comfortable homes for a very, very small amount of energy. I also found it really interesting that they were able to eliminate most of the red list chemicals. So most of the products inside of that house do not have known carcinogens in it. 
which is crazy. It's like, why does that have to be a beyond sustainable thing? Like, shouldn't all homes just not have cancer causing agents in them? And so it's kind of amazing that you can live in a house that looks almost normal, that has no carcinogens in it. Also amazing that we have to go to this extra level of intensity of this research to be able to be sure that our homes are not gonna kill us, essentially, which is kind of crazy. Anyways, I'm curious to know your comments uh, below. Like I said, uh, I've left a link to both of Chris's books that I highly recommend in the links below as well. If you found that useful, a thumbs up always helps for the video to track. And uh, we'll see you guys in the next video. I've interviewed Chris a couple more times, so you'll see a few more of his interviews coming up in future YouTube videos. Thanks so much, guys. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you guys in the next video.